Hi there, did you know that you were almost murdered today? Every single day you are the victim of attempted murder from a variety of viruses, fungus, bacteria, parasites, all who are trying to get into your system and murder you. Thankfully, you have a system that can help you. I mean, sure, these things look, you know, cute and cuddly and plushy, but, you know, drop your guard for one moment and BAM! You're a Streptococcus playground. Thankfully, you have an immune system which is there to protect you and keep you alive. There are many different levels of defense that you have in your immune system. And the first line of defense is the skin and the mucous membrane. The skin forms an impermeable barrier against any sort of invader. So viruses, bacteria can't cross that through that threshold and get into get past your skin. At the same time, you also have a ton of bacteria sitting on your skin surface that we form sort of an alliance with, well, more of a treaty, if you will, whereby we agree not to kill them and they agree not to kill us and in exchange we will walk them around, keep them warm, feed them a little bit and take them to interesting places and they in turn will keep bad bacteria from invading us. And so when bacteria that are foreign to your skin surface show up, those bacteria that are already resident will kind of treat them as uh, not, not friendly and they'll be very um, mean to them and, and possibly kill them. Actually, that, that will be their job. Every single day on your skin surface, there is an active war going on between different species of bacteria. Now, the, uh, the mucous membrane, which seems you know, soft and moist and a potential really nice portal of entry, has another defense and that is the mucus that it produces. Mucus has a really important function that it protects you by binding up bacteria, glomerating them all together, and impeding their process. Now, they can't get anywhere, and then after a little while, you just expel them. So now what happens if something breaches that barrier? Well, you're going to need to have a rapid reaction team, and that's the innate immune response. There are several different players in the innate immune response. The first one, and probably the most important, is the macrophages. Now, these are very large cells that are integral to your immune system, and they, their big job is to kind of wander around the body, just kind of doing a general cleanup, you know, taking care of anything that just happens along. They find a little random invader who's managed to, uh, to breach the barrier, they'll take care of it for you. They'll generally clean up anything that they encounter and they have a long life. They can do this for many years. The neutrophils uh, or the polymo uh, or PMNs uh, often are regarded as sort of the big guys of the immune system and, and they do perform a very important function but they're not nearly as important as the macrophages are. Now, Neutrophils are really cool because what they do is they have the ability to squeeze themselves into tight spots. So if you have a, you know, a trouble spot that's it's in between cells, your neutrophils are able to kind of get in there and squeeze through between cells and kind of get into the little spaces where they need to be. And once they get there, they go to town. The first thing they'll do is they'll find anything that's foreign and just engulf it. And when, once they've engulfed it, they have on their, inside their cell, cell uh, cytoplasm all of these little granules. And these little granules are little pockets of doom for all of the bacteria and viruses that happen to get into them. And the, 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 uh, the bacteria is in a little, is engulfed in, in, a, in a little, uh, uh, a little uh, cytosome. And then the, these little granules will come and fuse with it and it'll just kind of dump all of these chemicals onto the bacteria and kill it. The problem with, with uh, neutrophils is once they use their killing packets to kill whatever, they're, whatever they're, they've eaten, they don't have the ability to, re to make any more and so their only choice is to die. So their sole function in your body is to fight and die. And a lot of the things that are necessary to, to coordinate all of your immune system is, the use, is cytokines. The cytokines are not cells, they're actually just small proteins and they are a variety of different ones and I'm not going to go into all of the different types of cytokines that are out there. 
that's for your next level of immunology course. But each cytokine has a, a variety of different functions depending on the context in which it's being used. They function primarily as a, as a signaling molecule between two different cells. So if a cell comes in contact with another, they'll send out cytokines to basically speak to each other. And they also act as a marker for any trouble spots in order to give the rest of the immune system uh, a sense of where they have to go to rally up. Now, the vast majority of infections are going to be small, localized. You know, you get a little paper cut and a little bit of bacteria sneak in, and you know, your, your macrophages and neutrophils will take care of that, no problem, and, and it, it, you won't even bother mobilizing anything else. But some infections are a lot more serious, and then you need to really call in the troops. But calling up more troops, that takes time. And in order to do that, you need to use what we call the cellular immune response. The first step in the cellular immune response is the dendritic cells. The dendritic cells are not neutrophils or macrophages, but are similar to them in that they hang out kind of in the subcutaneous space, kind of are all over your body, and, and their job is, is not to clean up, but to pick up. So they'll be at a site of a war, and they'll just kind of pick up little bits and pieces of debris uh, from, the, from, the, from the battle. And they have on their surface what are called MHC, or major histocompatibility complexes. Now, these are proteins that will sit on the cell surface and are used as a signaling protein for other cells. Now, to use those, the dendritic cell will then take little bits and pieces of, of debris, these debris we'll call antigens, and it puts it onto an MHC and then puts it on its cell surface, sort of serving it up like a waiter at a, at a really fancy restaurant. The next most important cell in the immune system are the T helper cells. Now, these are lymphocytes, and lymphocytes like to hang out in the lymph nodes, and they are basically resident there and just kind of hang out, and you know, things get kind of brought to them, and they just kind of check out, and they're looking for action, but they're, they're just gonna hang, they're just, they just like to lay, Lay, lay around in the, t in the uh, lymph nodes and, and just wait for the business to be brought to them. What's really fascinating about, t about lymphocytes is that each one of these lymphocytes has a single receptor that's coded for the MHC, and, but it is coded only for a spe one specific antigen. So each and every single lymphocyte can only respond to one antigen, and it's unique to itself. So you can imagine the necessity of having literally billions of these, of these uh, lymphocytes floating around and being available to react to the myriad of different antigens that are in the environment that could be co possibly cause you troubles. So now how does this work? Well, you've got your lymphocyte just kind of hanging out in the, in the lymph node, minding its own business, just looking for a good time. And then there's a skin breach somewhere, you get a cut on your arm, and some bacteria happen to invade. And the macrophages will go to town and they'll start mawing, gnawing up everything and the neutrophils will get in there and they'll kind of start chewing things up and exploding them and killing them off and leaving all kinds of debris lying around, which the dendritic cells will then start picking up and putting into pockets on the MHC and then it takes them to the lymph node. And the lymph node finds a lymphocyte that will respond to that antigen. Now that specific lymphocyte now becomes activated. And its job after that is to divide, and divide, and divide, and make copies of itself, and then start going around looking for the source of the trouble. So the lymphocytes will then start making their way towards where the battle is going on, and it's gonna start using cytokines to activate further the macrophages. So the macrophages are just sitting there, they're already munching away, and maybe there's a few of them lying around that are just kind of like, well, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like a big deal to me. And the lymphocytes will show up and they'll start throwing them all kinds of, all kinds of cytokines at them, and those macrophages are then like super duper activated and just go to town on the, on the source of the infection. But like anybody who's in the military knows, sometimes in a ground war, you need to call in an airstrike. And in this case, antibodies are the source. 
Antibodies are proteins. Again, not cells, but proteins. And in the tips of the Ys are specific regions of the, of the protein that are coded for a specific antigen. Each antibody can only react to one specific antigen. So there are, again, billions of unique antibodies throughout your, bo that, throughout your body. Antibodies have a lot of really important functions. The first, first one is when you're exposed to a toxin like tetanus, the tetanus toxin can bind to an antibody, and when it binds to that antibody, it's now no longer functional. So this is why when people get, uh, get, get into an, a car accident, we give them tetanus toxoid. We, give them, we try to give them antibodies so that they can form resistance to any tetanus that's going to form because it takes time for the tetanus to, to grow in your, in, your, uh, in your system, for the clostridium bacteria to grow and, for, and start putting out tetanus toxin. So we want to give your body an, a head start. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of vaccinations in a little bit. So, tet so toxins by, that are bound to antibodies are completely non-functional and completely lost. You can also use antibodies through the two of their tines, if they bind to one and then the other one binds to another and then another antibody binds to the same one and a different one, you can see how you kind of glutinate these things and really gum up the system. So these, these, ba these, these bacteria and these, uh, uh, and these toxins can't get anywhere. They can't go anywhere and they can't do anything because they're all kind of glommed all together and agglutinated. As well, an antibody that is specifically coded to an active region of uh, of, a, of a bacteria or a virus can actually block that bacteria or virus's ability to be infectious by blocking the, the, the specific protein on that organism that is used to bind to the cells in your body to cause an infection. Antibodies also have a really important role in labeling and they make bacteria just this, this perfect spiciness, just, just the way macrophages love them. So when antibodies are bound to bacteria, the microphages now are even more, in, more enraged and are more inclined to eat those bacteria because they now actually know where they can, what, uh, what is trouble and what is not. A macrophage sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a morass of cells and debris sometimes has a hard time telling what is, inf what is an infection and what's just a dead cell. Antibodies label the things that are trouble and it allows the macrophages to just gnaw down on them. Antibodies also can bind, uh, when they bind to the surface of a bacteria, also have, uh, there's another entire complement uh, system called the complement system, which we're not going to talk about because it's much more complicated, but it's really cool. That when antibodies bind to, to bacteria, these complement proteins can actually form rings that just pop holes through the cells and can actually kill bacteria without any interaction with any cell, a lymphocyte, macrophage, or, or even neutrophil. So how do you make an antibody? Well, and you gotta do a lot of it, and you gotta make them real quick. And that falls to the job of the B lymphocyte. Now the B lymphocytes are similar to the T lymphocytes in that they are all individually unique. Each one of them carries an antibody on its surface that is specifically coded and it, is, it only produces that specific antibody. And just like the T lymphocytes, they like to hang out in the lymph node, and when things are coming their way, they like to taste, take a test and see if they're actually something they might be interested in. So again, how is this gonna work? Well, you got your B lymphocyte just kinda hanging out, having a good time, minding its own business, and you get a cut in your skin, and you get some bacteria in there, and you get some debris and the dendritic cells pick up those, those antigens, put them on an MHC, and then take that antigen over to the lymphocyte where, the, where one of those B cells recognizes and says, I, I, I know what that thing is. I, I'm actually coded to, 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 to bind with that antigen. It now becomes an activated B cell. And that activated B cell is about to commit to a path that it can't go back on and it wants to be absolutely certain that it is on the right path. It wants to make sure that that dendritic cell brought an antigen that was from a war that is a problem that has to be dealt with. So the B cell wants to use 
the help from the T cell. So the T helper cell comes along and it also has the antigen on its surface and it binds to the B cell and then starts throwing out a whole bunch of cytokines to tell the B cell that this thing that you tasted before, I've also tasted it before as well and I also know that it's trouble and here's some signals telling you that it's trouble. And so now that B cell is going to convert itself into a plasma cell. And a plasma cell has two functions. One, to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and make antibodies and just spew the antibodies into the system. Now we've talked a lot about bacteria. Bacteria are relatively large cells compared to the rest of the cells in the body, but what about viruses? Now viruses are smaller and they're not suckers. They're, gonna, they're not going to wait around for a macrophage to gnaw down on them. They're going to actually go and hide inside cells. That's their, that's, their, uh, that's their MO. They invade into a cell and then they take over the machinery of that cell to produce copies of itself. In doing so, not only do they spare themselves a lot of energy because they, they just use the cell's energy stores, but they also hide themselves away so that the macrophages can't get them. So you have a little cell, just a regular old body cell, just having a good old time, minding its own business, and suddenly it gets invaded by a virus. And the viruses are sitting inside its cells, and viruses do what viruses do. They take over, and they start multiplying, and they start multiplying, and eventually they really make that, that, that poor cell sick. Now you need help. You need another lymphocyte to come in and help out that cell. So you have a cell that's infected. Now it's not alone, it can, it's, not, it's, it's not completely defenseless. What it does is first it takes little pieces of the proteins from that virus that is being forced to make and puts them on a little MHC molecule and puts it on its cell surface. A little flag saying, hey guys, check it out. Look at this is what I got here. I got something like this hanging around inside me and I think it's probably trouble. Now to let everybody know that there's troubles, it starts putting out cytokines to alert everybody to the trouble. And these cytokines, well, they start attracting T cells. And so these lymphocytes start making their way through and they can come follow along the trail of cytokines saying, oh, there's some trouble around here. Let's get to see around. And one of them eventually comes in contact with the MHC and the antigen on the surface and that T cell recognizes it. And when it recognizes it, it doesn't help. Well, it doesn't help the cell individually, but it helps fight the infection because it can't do anything about getting inside the cell. It's, as it's big and the viruses are small and they're all hidden away, but what it can do is it can kill off that poor cell. It's infected, it's going to die anyways. Take it out, get rid of it, and then it can't be used to make more viruses. These types of lymphocytes are called T killer cells. They are the original terminators. Now, vaccines are one way in which we can give our immune system a head start and avoid problems. And how do vaccines work? Well, it's actually not rocket science. You, all you do is you take a vaccine, you put it in a syringe and you shoot it into somebody's arm. A vaccine, as far as the body is concerned, is just a bunch of proteins and the dendritic cells don't know any better and pick up some of those uh, proteins and think, oh, hmm, this, this could be something important load it onto a little MHC molecule, put it on a cell surface, and then go and serve it down to some of those beasts, some of those lymphocytes. And a T lymphocyte will recognize it. One out of billions will recognize it. And when it recognizes it, it gets activated. And when it gets activated, it starts doing what T lymphocytes do. It divides and divides and divides and divides and divides. At the same time, this is also happening with the B lymphocytes. So the, the dendritic cell goes and finds a B lymphocyte, 
The B lymphocyte, one of them happens to recognize on its, because its antibody is specifically coded to the antigen that was injected just by pure coincidence and, and probability, and that B lymphocyte now becomes activated. But again, it doesn't want to just start going nuts, so it waits until a T lymphocyte comes along and says, hey, I've, I've got this antigen too, and check it out, it's, it's kind of a problem. So here's some cytokines to let you know, yeah, it's a really big deal here. And when it does that, the B cell then converts itself into a plasma cell. And the plasma cell does what plasma cells do best, reproduces, 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 and produces tons of antibodies. Now, unlike a regular infection, at this point, both of the lymphocytes are like, kind of, you know, the macrophages have already gone in, they've kind of cleaned up all of the residual vaccine debris, everything's been presented, all the immune has been reacted, but there's nothing actually going on. And so those lymphocytes say, well, Whatever it was, it was bad news. So what we're going to do is a couple of us are, you know, the rest of you guys can kind of, you know, die. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is a couple of you guys are going to convert into memory cells. And these memory cells, they are long living. Sometimes for, in some people can live the entire life of the person. And they'll just kind of hang out in the, in the lymph nodes and just kind of wait around. But they're a little different than the naive T cells and, and B cells. Because now when a cut forms and an invasion begins and there's bacteria hanging around and there's some antigens there and the, and the uh, dendritic cell picks some of those same antigens up and brings them over to those, those memory cells, the memory cells behave differently. For one thing, the T cells immediately activate and they don't screw around they immediately start reproducing in force. And the B cells immediately convert into plasma cells. And they don't screw around, they immediately start reproducing as well and produce tons of antibodies. There's no messing around, this is quick, quick, quick. And in doing so, you will probably not even know that you were infected by that, in, by that virus or that bacteria because your immune system jumped on it so, so quickly. So obviously vaccines are a really good idea. We should, we should make more, like we should have like a vaccine for every bad disease that comes along that tries to kill us. Yeah, I agree, but it actually making a vaccine is kind of complicated. Um, the first person who actually came up with a vaccine was Edward Jenner, and he used what was called a natural analog. When he noticed that milkmaids who got cowpox didn't seem to get smallpox, they were protected. Even though cowpox and smallpox are two different viruses, they're the same family and they're kind of similar. And they, he noticed that there was a, clearly a relationship between them getting sick with one disease and not getting another. And so through a series of experiments, discovered that, that, was, that using a cowpox vaccine or a cowpox inoculation in advance protected people against smallpox. So the picture on the, on the left is, is actually a picture of Edward Jennings immunizing the very first child against smallpox. And I mean, we don't know about smallpox anymore because it's been eradicated from the planet, but at the time, smallpox was a scourge, mur murdering children by the thousands all the time. And there was no way to stop it. There was no, we didn't understand cell biology. We didn't understand microbiology for that matter. And there was really no hope. And Jenner brought hope by learning how to inoculate people against a natural analog virus. The, the statue on the right actually is, the, is, a, is a depiction of Edward Jennings inoculating his child. So you, you think he kind of believed in what he was doing if he was willing to do it to his own, his own son. And Unfortunately, he was also the first person to have to deal with an anti-vax movement because when a lot, some members of the general public discovered that he was inoculating people with cowpox, they got it in their head that if they got the cowpox shot, they were going to get turned into cows. And so there was this uproar over that. 
which just goes to show you that ignorance transcends the ages. So you're probably now thinking, uh, well, you know, this doesn't seem that complicated. I mean, we've just talked about the importance of antigens. Why don't you just get a bunch of antigens and stick it in, and, and there you go, and, and it'll work. But it doesn't, it's not that simple. Uh, when you inject an antigen, it, only, it also has to invoke an immune reaction, but it also has to be the right thing. So just putting a virus in a blender and injecting it, hoping that you know, we'll, it'll, you know, somehow there's enough of an immune response that it will, that it will cause you to become immune, immunized, there's no guarantee. And also, when you do that kind of thing where you try to kill a virus, you, you, they're, they're not really alive, and so killing something that's not really alive is a challenge. And frankly, uh, if you mess up and one of even just one virus happens to survive the process, and you inject that into somebody, you just gave them an infection. Congratulations. So this has been tried, and it works for some things, but it doesn't work for a lot of them. The next big leap forward, though, came with live attenuated viruses, and we used this in the battle against polio. And polio, again, in the 1950s was a scourge that was murdering children in large droves. And many people, if you talk to your parents uh, or grandparents, they'll tell you about the fear that they had with polio. And in the, in the 1950s, uh, Jonas Stock discovered that Polio virus could infect human cells, but also monkey cells, but it infected monkey cells less well. So what he did is he started taking the virus and infecting monkey cells. Now, evolution being what it is, it tries to find the advantage. And these viruses were kind of infective into the cells, but not really. And so over time, they became more keyed towards infecting monkey virus, because that's the environment that they were in. They're using, he used evolution to his advantage. And he did this many, many times over until eventually those viruses, which are still polio, were only able to infect monkey cells, but couldn't infect human cells. So if you took those polio viruses that couldn't infect humans anymore and injected them into humans, your immune system didn't know the difference, and you became immune against polio, both the monkey-specific form and the human-specific form. And people kept trying different methods to try to develop vaccines. And then it was, again, in the 1980s, we had another leap forward when we were able to now uh, sequence DNA, and we could actually look at the genetic code. And people knew that hepatitis B uh, when people got hepatitis B, not everybody stayed infected, and there were a population of people who got the inve uh, infection and cleared the virus. But when they cleared the virus, they had antibodies against the surface proteins of the virus. And so it seemed like that, that was the antibody that was really uh, important in developing an immune response and fighting off the infection. And because we had the ability to sequence the DNA of a, of a hepatitis virus, we could then find the sequence that made the surface protein, and you take that piece of information and you drop it into a yeast cell, and the yeast cell, it's not a virus, sits there and it just took up the DNA and it started producing all of these proteins, not making a virus, but actually just producing just the surface coat that was the source of the immune response. And you could then scoop up all of that, inject it into somebody, and bam, they now developed antibodies against the surface coat of the hepatitis B virus. And so when the actual hepatitis B virus came looking for trouble, you were already protected. The final and the most recent step that is the great leap forward and came just in time with the coronavirus is mRNA vaccines. Now, this is not magically developed in the last year. This has been going on for decades. The, de the technology to, 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 to uh, use mRNA as a vector for, virus, uh, for, um, for vaccine development has been going on for a long time. Now, just, to, just as a reminder, mRNA, messenger RNA, is a portion of genetic material that is not DNA. It's not in your nucleus. If you try to, to use DNA directly to make protein, which is the vast majority of what, uh, what a cell is doing, 
you would have to, in a very packed environment, you'd have to bring all of the material necessary to make protein and kind of squeeze it inside a cell. And the DNA is all really tightly wound up and it's really hard to get into. You have to unwind it a little bit and then you have to get all these little proteins in there to kind of then start producing the protein and you have to get them out of there because it's plugging up the system. The easier thing to do is to unroll a little bit of the DNA, make a copy of it, let the DNA re-roll, and then get that mRNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where there's a ton of room. And then once it's in the cytoplasm, there are proteins called ribosomes, which take the, DNA, the, the mRNA, look at it, read it, and produce the protein from it. So this is transcription all the way to translation. An mRNA vaccine works by taking advantage of the dendritic cell's ability to both produce proteins like any other cell in the body, but also its job of serving up those proteins as antigens. So all you have to do now is you have the genetic code for a virus or a bacteria that you're interested in, a section of the protein that you want to use as, a, as the source of your vaccine. You create the mRNA. It's, it's not hard to actually translate. You don't need a you don't you don't need to do the DNA to mRNA translation using the cell. You just it's we know how to do that. It's it's not it's not hard. Produce a chunk of mRNA. You bind it inside a inside a liposome or a fat cell or a uh, it's just a little ball of fat. And inside that little ball of fat sits all of this mRNA, and then you inject that into somebody, and when it hits a dendritic cell, the dendritic cell takes it up, and it you know, releases out, opens up, and it finds inside it is a bunch of mRNA. And the ribosomes, they don't know any better. They just grab onto that mRNA, like and they start making whatever protein you've coded it to make. And it displays it on an MHC, takes it to the lymphocytes, and it invokes an immune response. This is a game changer for a variety of different reasons. Most importantly, it makes, it makes vaccine discovery so much faster. You can sequence a virus, you can sequence a bacteria, you can focus on a specific area that you think is going to be the source of a, a good immunological response, and you can just take that copy, make it a little bit of mRNA, pop it into your little cassette of, of, of your, of your, vec of your, uh, uh, um, your um, lipid uh, vector, and you can just test it. And if that didn't work, by tomorrow you'll know, and then the next day you pick your next candidate and you drop it in there. Or you can distribute it out to a whole bunch of other labs. And between hundreds of different labs, you can rapidly discover a vaccine for any number of different diseases. Production will also become that much faster. I mean, sure, right now it's, you know, production and logistics has been a challenge, but we are just having to scale up something that we didn't even know would work a year ago, discovered, much to our delight, that it was going to be in a brutally effective way to develop a vaccine against coronavirus, but we had to scale it up for billions of people all at once. Yeah, of course, this was going to take a little bit of time, but production is going to be so much faster in the future primarily because the information is easily disseminated. I mean, you just need to know a chunk of, of, of genetic code, and you can send that via email to anybody, and then in their lab, they can make a copy of that information. They can create their own mRNA vaccine, uh, vector, and then they can start producing their own. This, 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 this genetic code on the, on the right here, this is, uh, I got this, this is the spike protein for the coronavirus that is being used in the vaccines that are now being made and are available to, to defeat this pandemic. I got that off Twitter. Just, you know, it's just, it's just out there. Like, this is not secret information. It's readily available, and it's easy to disseminate now in an electronic world. And lastly, vaccines are not now limited just to infections. When somebody gets leukemia, when children get uh, some forms of leukemia, those cells, those leukemic cells, they're not foreigners, they're natural, they're your own cells that have gone crazy, but they produce proteins that your body doesn't see on a regular basis, it's not normal for it. So it, part of fighting off cancer is actually your immune system fighting as well. 
So what if we could take those proteins that we know that those cells will produce and vaccinate people against them? Imagine being able to vaccinate people against cancer. It's possible now. And just as a reminder, mRNA vaccines are not going to change your genetic code. It doesn't work that way. DNA to mRNA to protein is a one-way street. There is no going back. And people who are afraid of, of having mRNA vaccines that will invade your body and cause your, change your genetic material, they either don't understand biology or they have some belief that if you are in a house and you bring in a set of blueprints for something else, that those blueprints will somehow change the walls of your house. I mean, that's the same thing. It's, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. That's just a lack of knowledge. It is a one-way street. It will not change you, except it will make you better because you won't get infected by whatever that mRNA was coding you against. Now, one other question that people often have is, well, you know, why do I have to get a flu shot every year? And well, it's unfortunately, it's kind of a side, side uh, cost of having an, a really highly effective immune system. Um, recognition does have a downside. So I'm gonna just use this by way of an example. So let's say in 2016, there was a flu virus going around and it had antigens A, B, C, and D, okay? Now, you get, in, you get, you get exposed to that flu and those antigens you've never seen before. And so you'll eventually fight it off, but you're gonna get sick because you have no immune response initially, and you're gonna be sick for like 14 days. In 2017 comes along, the virus mutates a little bit because that's what, mu that's what viruses do. And instead of having an D antigen, it now has an E antigen. So the virus now is about 75% similar to what you've seen before and your immune response is 75% as effective as it was before. Because after your last infection, you developed all the memory cells and you have now the ability to respond to the flu virus. Except you can't respond to the E antigen. And so your immune system is just a little hobbled by this. Now, while the initial infection was going on in 2016, you got anti antibodies against all of those. Now, in 2017, your immune system is in fight mode. It's not really in learn mode because there are these cells called T suppressor cells that are kind of damping down the learning because it's like, look, we already know what we're dealing with here as far as, as far as we're concerned, so just deal with it and let's not focus too much on the learning. So what happens is some of the virus will slip through. You'll get sick, eh, but for only a day. It's not that big of a deal. But the other thing is that E antigen got missed. And then next year, in 2018, the flu mutates a little bit more and you get a response to the A and the B antigens, but you, you don't really have a response to E and F and so your immune response is only 50% effective. And you're, you're gonna get rid of it, but again, you're only gonna be, and you're gonna be sick for about four days. 2019 comes along now the virus is really changing relative to what your immune system is used to. A, it recognizes, but none of the other ones it hasn't really ever seen. And so your immune response is only 25% effective and you're going to be sicker for a little bit longer. In 2020, same problem. E, F, G, and H, you've never, as far as your immune system is concerned, you've never seen them before because while they were there in, the, in all of the previous infections, you didn't really generate an immune response against them because your T suppressor cells were kind of just in the fight mode at the time. And so it's completely foreign to you and you're gonna get sick. Now, if you get the flu shot in 2016 and you get A, B, C, and D, you're gonna be presupposing your, your, uh, your immune system against those antigens. And because your antigens aren't in full out fight mode at the time, it generates a vigorous immune response against all of those four antigens. 2017, you get A, B, C, D, and, or A, B, C, and E. Now, because this is a vaccination and not an infection, your immune system 
has the ability to respond and learn. And it picks up that yeah, there's, that, there's a little E in there that I didn't see before, and it generates an immune re response against the E. So when the ABCE virus comes into your, comes and tries to invade you, you actually are already immune because you've been exposed to all of those, those antigens, and so you get sick for no days. 2018, same thing happens. You get exposed in a quiet, controlled manner to two new ant antigens you've seen before, A, B, and E, but you've never seen F before. You get F, and so you get an antibody response to it. And so when, when, they, when the flu comes along, you're immune, and you don't get sick, and so on, and so on. And this is why it's because viruses mutate, and because our immune system has the ability to respond in fight mode, but less in learn mode at those times. Vaccination is important every year because every year you need to be re-exposed re to all of the different antigens that are out there that you may have missed on the last or the previous infections. And that's all there is to it. The immune system is incredible. It is, it, it, it keeps you alive. It, it is responsible for 99.9999999999% of the time you're infected and you never even knew it. Occasionally one will slip through the cracks. The immune system does this automatically and it does it as a byproduct of millions of years of evolution across thousands of species to get to where we are today. A system that is capable of responding to an infinitely unknown knowable number of antigens in the environment, they're all trying to kill you. And it does it without any conscious thought on your part, any direction, and no consciousness on the part of those cells. They really are quite a remarkable and powerful system in your body. And you should honor that by getting your shots, whether it be coronavirus, flu shot, any vaccine that's available, you should give your body a head start because it does a better job when it knows in advance and it will do everything it can to keep you alive. Thanks.